First of all, thank you for foregoing a gorgeous, sun-filled time outside to, to spend a little bit of time learning pediatric emergency medicine. I don't have any disclosures, but I do have to let you know that there weren't any huge, cutting-edge, mind-blowing articles that really kind of transformed our practice in emergency medicine. But with that being said, I am going to promise you something. By the end of this lecture today, you're going to learn something new that you can bring back to your clinical practice at home. Now, that something new may not be clinical. Well, heck, it might not even be relevant. But you're going to learn something new, and that's my goal by the end of the day. And if you, I'm going to make a challenge to you. If, if somebody can honestly tell me by the end of this lecture that you can't, didn't learn anything new, I'll buy you a drink. Sound good? We'll enjoy it by the pool. Here we go. Today we're going to talk about fever, fluids, and booze. Okay, not exactly booze. It's actually more brew. Or the brief, resolved, unexplained event, formerly known as ALTI. All right, fair enough? Now, if you may remember, let's take the case of the febrile young infant. This is kind of confusing for some people. It is confusing. The next step should be, well, it depends. Are they a neonate? Are they one to two months? Two to three months? More than three months? It seems like to me, any time I was in residency and fellowship, and even as an attending, it seemed like every single pathway depended on the day, depending on the time, depending on what the heck else was going on in the department, it was a giant mess to try and figure out all these algorithms. Can I get a few nods in the audience? Yeah. And could I also maybe get this updated? Perfect. Thanks. So a couple years, two years ago, actually, is anybody here two years ago for this uh, talk? Just need to know how many jokes I can repeat. Okay, thanks. So I simplified a couple years ago this concept of you know, breaking down fever into the ABCs and one, two, threes. And if you'll kind of travel with me a little bit, A for analysis of urine, B for blood, and C for CSF. A, Bs, and Cs. Easy enough? Now, if you're gonna choose one, you're always gonna pick culture over the original, right? The definitive is the culture, so you'd rather get culture over your analysis, blood culture over CBC, and we almost always are going to get culture if we get CSF on any young febrile infant. Right? And then plus or minus chest x-ray, plus or minus antibiotics. So this is the algorithm I came up with a couple years ago, not based on Rochester or Boston or Philadelphia. Those are kind of the hallmark, low-risk febrile infants. Uh, so Thank you. So these aren't really based on those. This is kind of the Mimi strategy. All right? It's not documented anywhere. It's not even validated anywhere. But this is what I used, and it actually systematically was supported in the literature. So between zero and one month of age, if you line up on that column, you go A, Bs, and Cs. A for analysis of urine, B for blood, C, CSF, and finally admit. Between one to, two years of, uh, one to two months of age, excuse me, you cross off the bottom and move up to the top. So you still got urine, blood, CSF, didn't necessarily need to admit, after two months of age, you got your first set of shots, cross off the bottom, and move on to the top, move up to the next. And then that kind of transgressed all the way up until about four months of age, until you got this kind of systematic approach. Now, a couple years ago, we had some epidemiologic studies that really showed that bacteremia, meningitis, turns out vaccinations were working. All of these levels were plummeting down, down, down. Boston, Rochester, Philadelphia criteria were all done before the huge implementation of Hib vaccines, before Prevnar, initially seven, then 10, now 13, got instituted. And those large-scale studies have kind of left us with a what-do-we-do-now approach. So ASAP finally came out uh, in the past year after almost 15 years before their last rendition of a clinical policy for well-appearing infants, younger than two years of age presenting to the emergency department. All right? It was not a comprehensive review, but it did give us some additional guidelines and recommendations. Throughout the pres presentation, I'm going to highlight three articles that I think are worth reading on your own. Two of them are actually clinical policies and helpful to know what the, the standard is that, not the standard, but a, a recommendation and policy are for, for following. All right. So what did this tell us? Two months to two years, what are we worried about, right? UTIs, pneumonias, and meningitis. Those are some of the big serious bacterial infections that we'll worry about. The ASAP clinical policy, in summary, says viral infections decrease the risk of a UTI. Okay, we have several studies that support that, but there's still a risk, all right? Notice that it's level C evidence, as are all the other recommendations that go throughout this clinical policy. So viral infection, if you can call it bronchiolitis, if you can call it otitis, if you can call it sinusitis, if you can call it whatever-itis, it still poses a risk for a urine infection. 
What are the numbers? Urine infection in this age group, anywhere, the data is anywhere from maybe 5 to 17 percent. If you have a viral infection, it drops it by about half. Okay, so parents want to go, well, what's the risk? That's some approximate numbers you can tell them. The recommendation is also that if you start antibiotics because you're worried about a urine infection, please check a urine culture. Just add that on as a test, because that's ultimately the definitive. We have enough high contamination rates, which make it a potential problem just to routinely di uh, start initiate antibiotics without checking cultures. And if the urine dip is negative, but you're still concerned, maybe there's a history of reflux or frequent UTIs, just it's okay to go ahead and add on a culture. Easy enough, right? So you'll find that an ongoing theme with fever, 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 is check the pee, check the pee, check the pee. What about pneumonia? Right? Consider a chest x-ray. This was level B evidence. If you have cough, rails, hypoxia, high fever greater than 39 degrees, or a fever that lasts greater than 48 hours. Alternatively, if the heart rate, if you're tachycardic or tachypnic out of proportion to your fever, also consider a chest x-ray. This got a level B level of evidence, so a little bit better, but this goes contrary a little bit to AAP's uh, recommendations that suggest we, we don't need to get routine chest radiographs on all these infants. So there is a little bit of a discrepancy between the two, the two uh, groups. Similar to the 2014 guidelines that got released on bronchiolitis, they are not recommending routine chest radiographs if you suspect bronchiolitis. Remember bronchiolitis, it's clinical, right? Runny nose, happy baby, wheezing all over, all right? Anybody see bronchiolitis ever? I know it's rare. Yeah, around this time, yeah, think about it. So no routine chest x-rays in them, but otherwise consider a, a chest x-ray for some of these other cases. Now finally, the one to three month, that meningitis. Uh, Dr. Rudinsky gave a great PK earlier about LP or not LP in that young febrile infant. What do we have here? If you're ever worried, go ahead and do the, consider the LP. If they're ill appearing, anything else, do the LP, all right? Otherwise, a lot of the literature, and we'll go through some of it now, is really supporting a more selective approach to the use of LPs in that young febrile infant, especially if there's a concomitant viral illness. I talked about how viral illnesses are going to lower your risk of UTI. It really lowers that risk of meningitis. A few studies out there, essentially almost zero risk of concomitant meningitis and a viral illness, especially if you can name it, bronchiolitis, right, influenza, uh, otitis. And level C evidence also predominates if you do, do, decide not to do an LP, please don't start antibiotics. Consider close follow-up, consider some other alternatives, okay, or observation, unless you document an ulterior source. So let's say you have a UTI, and you say, now I'm about to start antibiotics on this two months old. Do I have to do an LP to roll out meningitis because I'm starting antibiotics? We had a study a couple years ago that actually said, no, actually, you probably don't. That risk is still very, very low, right? Possible concomitant risk of bacteremia, but not meningitis, all right? The second review, which I also recommend as a read, is Evaluation and Management of a Febrile Children, a Review. This one was actually promoted a little bit more of the selective approach and incorporated a lot more of the recent epidemiology, not advocating for all this routine blood work that uh, ASEP kind of didn't definitively help us with. This is a newer one that came out this year. It's a couple years ago, they tried this sequential approach I've been talking about to identify these young febrile infants at risk for invasive bacterial infections, right? Essentially, they called it the step-by-step -step method, and they validated it this year. And here's the idea. They compared step-by-step, -step, which is you do a step-by-step -step approach to the evaluation, to Rochester. Rochester carried the highest negative predictive value of those three original studies versus the lab score. Right. Infants less than 90 days with a fever without a source. Please remember, these are all well-appearing infants that are immunocompetent, healthy, with no other source, and they're well-appearing. Right. Low risk of ice, uh, invasive bacterial organisms. And what did they find? They said, if you kind of go through this algorithm, who is low risk? Let's blow it up and summarize. So if you have a child that's ill-appearing, if you have a child that's a neonate, technically they said 21 days, but I'm going to extend out to neonate, or if you have a child that has a UTI, stop their high risk. Right. If you have procalcitonin as a biomarker, how many of you have procalcitonin? I'm certain some more, we don't, ours is a send out, we get it back like five days later, so it's not quite useful, but I think that's the general trend when it comes out for this young uh, febrile population, and eventually I think we're gonna get much, much better data to help us delineate these low risk patients that we can discharge readily from the ED. 
high-risk patient for procalcitonin if it's abnormal, and the CRPs and ANCs made you intermediate risk. But I think much like the heart score, many of us aren't willing to accept that moderate or intermediate risk category, nor the high-risk category. So if you had any of those factors, if you could say no to all of them, they were a low-risk patient that you could send home. If you said yes to any of them, you had to stop and do a little bit more selective testing. That was the idea of the step-by-step -step method that came out. Right? So what do we do with this febrile young infant? Oops. Less than a neonate, uh, a neonate at any age, 28 to 30 days, we're still at a point where we need full septic workup. I do not think that we have enough evidence from the emergency department to support discharge home without any intervention in these. There are some outpatient studies, but I don't think that applies to us in the emergency department. What about the one to two month of age? This is when that selective approach to laboratory starts coming in. Same with two to three months and even three months, over three months. But the big take home for all of those is check the urine. Let's talk about, I'm talking about a lot about urine. Let me give you some backup data. The money is always in the P, all right? There are certain risk factors that AAP puts out, uh, age, race, duration of the fever, uh, height of the fever even. And these are all, you can look these up readily, but the idea is basically girls less than two years of age, boys less than one year of age, uncircumcised, uh, uncircumcised boys less than one year of age, and circumcised boys less than six months of age is, is a quick summary, okay? So you may remember this article a couple years ago, I introduced this. This was a simulation technique to attain midstream urine and urine. Because what happens? You tell the parents, oh, your child has a fever. I went to this amazing lecture at AAM, and they told me, check the pee, so I'm going to check the pee. And so, okay, parents are like, well, what are you going to do? How are you going to get him to pee? He said, well, I'm going to cath him. And they're like, oh, I don't want that. What are my options? Well, this came out and said, here's a simulation technique to obtain midstream clean catch in newborns, right? So basically, you, if you look at the pictures there, you feed them, and then you do a super pubic tap at about 100 beats per minute for 30 seconds, and then you do a lumbar sacral massage, and then you repeat until you, they pee. Easy enough, right? This was done in newborns. And, and a couple of people actually told me afterwards that, that, that it worked for them. That was great. But then the question was, what do you do after the newborn period? This study came out in this past year that says, okay, let's take that study and apply it to kids up to six months of age, right? And they found that this clean cath urine technique, effect, uh, technique was effective in almost 50% of the patients. That's so much easier than like cathing them and doing everything else, right? And their contamination rates for clean catch versus catheterization was uh, non-significant. Uh, so there were similar contamination rates. They did, however, find that the cutoff was about three months of age, because I'm pretty sure that holding this baby up for a couple of minutes while you're trying to clean catch that baby, bad boy, is going to be pretty darn difficult. So in this study, uh, quick and effective, less than 90 days, it's a good way, or at least an easy attempt, at trying to get a clean catch urine. Has anybody tried that yet? No? Uh, alternatively, for your um, older adults, you can always do the hand in warm water after a night of drinking. That's also very effective. Just make sure you get the bags ready, okay? All right. So, mention, speaking of contamination rates, I never really, I always thought, okay, well, clean catch, that's, you know, they don't wipe right, there's going to be some other issue. So I said, well, of course you have to catheterize. That's going to be so much better. And then I saw this study that actually opened my eyes a little bit. What are the contamination rates of the different urine collection methods? What if you don't do clean catch? You catheterize. What if parents say, I don't want you to catheterize? What's the, the essentially the gold standard is super pubic aspiration, All right? So what I used to do if parents are really like, I don't want you to cath, I would just bring in a giant needle and say, oh, no problem, I'll do the super pubic aspiration. It's way more accurate. And all of a sudden they let me cath. It was kind of maybe a little dirty, but that's okay. So was their urine. It was contaminated. So this study was interesting. Clean catch contamination rates, 26%. Uh, catheterization, 12%. Superpubic aspiration, 1%. I was surprised that the contamination rates were so high, even with catheterization. But it kind of goes back to that original comment that I made, just add on the culture, make it definitive. Let's try and limit the unnecessary antibiotics that we're exposing these patients to. All right, so let's say you had the eight-month female with a fever, 102, I'll even give you a 103, two days, no source. Right? We've been talking about checking the P, checking the P, checking the P. What's the next question that somebody's going to ask you? Can I bag the patient? Right? Can I just put a bag on the patient? Well, that last article we just talked about said, well, no, those contamination weights are way too high, and I can't rely on them. Well, maybe there's another way. This was a great study by CHOP. They actually, it was a quality improvement uh, study, and they did a two-step process for screening for UTIs. 
in an attempt to reduce catheterization rates. They looked at six months to two years, right? Can we reduce these catheterization rates? They're painful, everybody's distraught, it's challenging. Is there anything that we can do safely, reliably, without addressing anything? And what they did is based, as soon as they hit the room, not, not in triage, but as soon as they hit the room, the nurses put a bag on the patient. And then they let them drink and encourage them to drink. And every 30 minutes, they went to check to see if there was any urine, right? To make sure their bag hadn't fallen off or something like that. And that was the idea. And if they had urine, they sent it off. If it was negative, they said, looks good. If they were worried, they added on a culture. But if they, it was negative, they said, no TI, we're done. No UTI, we're done. If it was positive, they said, then we're going to go to catheterization. And they explained this all up front to the parents. And they had buy-in from the entire staff. It was a huge rollout and educational process. But they actually decreased the rates of catheterization from 60% in this age group to less than 30%, with no changes in revisits or missed UTIs, right? Maybe a neat approach to consider that two-step method. Again, going back to the original, if you're ever worried or have concerns or just aren't even sure, you can still send it for urine culture. All right, so that's a way that we might be able to bag. All right, so what's the big deal? All right, years ago, we, over the past few years, I feel like there's this big shift towards no antibiotics, right? Otitis, wait and see, sinusitis, wait 10 days, strep throat, pff, military recruits back in like a random island, doesn't apply anymore. Please give me something I can throw antibiotics at. Somebody asked me, and one of my colleagues actually, a really good question, goes, all right, how many of these are actually problematic, right? Aren't we just over-treating UTIs? And I thought, that's not an unreasonable question to ask. So this study looked at whether or not we need to give early antibiotic treatment for febrile urinary tract infections and the incidence of renal scarring. Because when I was taught in going through training, I was taught we have to treat UTIs in infants because they have a much higher risk for renal scarring of the, uh, the renal parenchyma than adults do. And that's why we're so aggressive with this. And I said, all right, let's take a look. Retrospective cohort, almost 500 patients, less than six years of age, and they defined renal scarring with a DMSA scan. And they tried to look at, hey, if there's a delay in antibiotics, does this make things worse? And the bottom line was, yeah, this uh, renal scarring, new renal scarring was about 7% for an untreated UTI that was left to go for a couple of days with the fever without treatment. And so what was my take-home message for this? Looks like it might be an issue in kids, a little different from adults. And secondarily, if I'm suspecting urine infection, go ahead and start treatment. Send off those culture results for definitive. All right. So sometimes you're like, oh, just follow up with your doctor in a couple of days. Have them follow up tomorrow. Have them follow up sooner if you're not going to be definitive and start. All right. So this is one of those exceptions that I'll say early initiation of antibiotics with proven UTI is helpful. All right. What about diarrhea? All right. That eight-month-old that I talked about a little earlier, let's say she had diarrhea for a couple days and all of a sudden spiked a fever. Of course, I'm thinking, well, she's been sitting in poop a lot. So of course, there's contamination that's gonna give her a urine infection. This study is a small study. It only looked at a couple patients, but interestingly, they had no increased incidence of UTI from this age group. The average age of this study was about two years of age. Now, I'm not gonna say, admit that this is gonna change my practice because I still know in that under two-year age group, especially in female patients, they're naturally at higher risk of UTI anyways. But it's something to consider where I may not just kind of routinely push for urine infections if it's a febrile diarrhea episode in that three-year-old, four-year-old, five-year-old, six-year-old. Okay. All right. I did my workup. I said, okay, wait, no UTI. Maybe I massaged their lumbar sacral area. Maybe I caught things, something in a bag. Now what do I do? This is when that selective approach to the fever comes in. Here's that chart that I kind of drew out a little bit earlier. Zero to one month, we're done. With that neonate full septic workup admission, that I think is still the standard. One to two month of age, here's that selective approach. If I check the urine, what next? We kind of swung this pendulum of do everything. It used to be when I was in training, full septic workup, two months and under, no question. And then it started swinging back with epidemiology saying, hmm, maybe we don't really need to check all this. I mean. Bacterial contamination rates are always higher than the risk of actual bacteremia, right? Meningitis is so low right now because vaccinations work. And so there was this push away to just check the urine. And now I think this pendulum swung somewhere in the middle where it's a little bit more about selective testing. So check the urine, hands down. Next, 
a lot of my colleagues will advocate for checking the blood work. Now, I don't think you're wrong. I, don't think, you, I think you have literature to support you both ways, but a conservative approach would be to still check the blood work. If you're going to get the CBC, get the blood culture at the same time. And then finally, that CSF, whether or not to do the LP, again, goes back to, is there another source? Do you have viral tests that are suspicious, like RSV positive or influenza positive? Those are markedly going to reach almost zero uh, chance of meningitis with those. Do you have other inflammatory markers, procalcitonin, CRP, where you can utilize that stepwise approach to not need to do an LP routinely on all these kids? Now, if you stuck with, I'm still going to do everything, uh, full septic workup, I'm still concerned, uh, I'm not definitive in all the literature, a lot of it's B and C evidence, that goes back to ASEP's clinical policy saying, if you're worried about an LP, go ahead and do it. You're okay, you're supported for it, okay? And then after two months of age, what happens is you get, you get your first set of shots. And after that, I, I think there's more supportive literature that you really don't need to do anything outside of urine, checking the urine. Some will advocate for still getting some blood, and I think you're supported if you get that. But for the most part, after two months of age, if they're healthy, if they're immunized, if they're well-appearing, if they're term, just check the urine. All right? What's the bottom line? Check the pee. All right. So going on to the next... Oh, we're going to take a break. We're going to take a mental break. Um, so through the past couple of years, I've had the honor of, of being here and, and introducing some hacks, some parenting hacks. Uh, my kids are now four and almost two, and I actually feel like I'm almost getting, as, people are getting as much out of the hacks as they are the actual lecture, and, and I'm okay with that. But this was one of my favorite ones through the, the years, the get-along shirt. I have yet to introduce this to my boys, but I'm thinking about it more and more. So how many parents do we have out in the audience? All right. Everybody else like, just likes to borrow them for a little bit, take them around the park, and send them on the way. Fair enough. All right, here are the hacks. We're in beautiful, beach-laden Florida. And you can't help but notice there's a ton of bugs everywhere. Apparently, if you sprinkle some cinnamon in a sandbox or on the beach nearby, yeah, it kind of keeps the bugs away. Who knew? All right? Now, what if you had a nice day, you were playing in the water, and you're, you got sand all over your body? It's annoying, right? You're trying to hose them off in the meantime. Baby powder. Sprinkle a little baby powder in, dry it all up, and just dust off that sand. Goes well for the hair, too. Now, remember, I challenge you, you're going to learn something in, during this lecture. Um, sometimes I get ready for work. Usually I'm in scrubs, but when I'm actually trying to dress up, my kids are everywhere. They're getting, like, spilling breakfast on me, everything else like that. So this was a neat hack. You just wear a bathrobe all morning long, and as soon as you've dumped the kid, uh, excuse me, uh, Taking the children someplace acceptably appropriate, take off that bathrobe, right? It kind of keeps your outfit clean and it lets you, allows you to get prepared during the day, too. I like that. That was a good mom trick. What about for the kids? What if you're giving them a paint set and what do you, it's all over, right? You hope that it's really washable paint as advertised. This was neat. That, that glad kind of peel and stick stuff, like... Right? As a little, basically, instead of a smock, which I thought was brilliant. Please make sure you stop below the mouth, though. All right? That's going to be, as tempting as it is to go above, just, just make sure you go a little lower. All right. Um, at the end of a day, maybe you're thinking, I need a little wine. You, Oops, I forgot to chill it. All right? Wet some paper, wrap it around the bottle, throw it in the freezer for about 15 minutes. You'll have nice chilled wine in 15 short minutes. And let's say last night you were out enjoying a little night on the town. Anybody? St. Patty's Day? All right, a couple nods. So I'll tell you over enjoyed yourself a little too much. Apparently spraying your clothes with vodka makes them smell better, since vodka kills odor-causing uh, bacteria right on the spot. Um, it also may, I don't know, keep you high enough for long enough to, for that oh, hangover. But uh, spray a little, spritz a little vodka may help get rid of some of that smell. And uh, Tic Tacs, this is a nice little hack. You know that little ridge right on the Tic Tac container? Apparently, that's for dispensing. I didn't know that. All right, so you can actually dispense one Tic Tac at a time. And finally, at the end of the night, if you're trying to figure out what end does that stupid little dangly thing go off in the, the, the toilet, apparently, here's your answer. All right, so those are the hacks. Are we still learning stuff? All right, let's move on to the next case. Eight-year-old presents with abdominal pain and vomiting. We talked about fever earlier. Now we're going to talk about fluids. Let's say they vomit twice. What's your differential? What about five times? Ten times? Let's throw in some diarrhea to that bad mix. Twice, differential. Five times, ten times? 
Well, if you're in my residency, apparently the differential is viral, 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 viral. All right, so let's talk about it. Viral gastroenteritis. How many of you heard of Zoe and Go? How many of you like Zoe and Go? How many of you just love it, right? So, okay. Zoe and Go being on Dancitron or Zofran. Hydrate them up, they look great, you do repeat the exam, everybody's happy. Right? The Zoe and Go, and some astute med students are like, oh, this concept of Zoe and Go, I love it. They say, wait a second, isn't there something about some sort of EKG thing that looks something like this after Zofran? Is this something I actually have to worry about? Do I need to get screening EKGs on everyone? How many of you are getting routine screening EKGs on all our adult patients? All right, so the question actually is like, what did we do with the kids? Did it matter more, right? So a couple things came out. Fatal cardiac arrest in two children, possible role of ondansetron. That sounds scary, right? This brought, this actually doubled the case incidence in pediatric patients up to four so far. This follow-up study uh, in, looked at risk of ventricular arrhythmias in association with ondansetron. Three kids in 100,000 had issues. And that, the take-home point of that article is really if you had an underlying congenital cardiac anomaly, this might be the kind of child that you want to get a, a screening EKG on but otherwise they weren't really finding a lot of risk factors and didn't advocate for routine EKG testing. And finally, this study came out in the PICU and said, oh, actually some kids had some problems. They definitely prolong their QTC, above that 500 threshold, millisecond threshold. But those kids, well, first of all, they were in the PICU. The ones that were at high at risk had electrolyte abnormalities, organ dysfunction, right? That may not really be applicable in our ED. But so I don't think, based on kind of the studies that are rolled out there, that I would advocate for routine screening. Unless, of course, maybe they had an underlying congenital cardiac issue where I'd probably end up getting an EKG anyways. So, all right, so we're done. Let's say we mild gastroenteritis. We gave them some Zofran, and now what? Right? You're going to hydrate them up. You're going to give them some fluids, right? What kind of fluids are you going to encourage them to drink? I was always taught Pedialyte. Who's tried Pedialyte? How many of you like the taste of Pedialyte? How many of you hate children enough to make them drink Pedialyte? Right? Oh, but it's grape flavored. Doesn't matter. All right. So this was a neat study. They looked at almost 300 kids, mild gastroenteritis, and they said dilute apple juice or drink of preference, dilute being uh, half apple juice, half water, compared to some sort of electrolyte maintenance solution. And they looked at failure rates. Right? That sounded like a cool study. I was always taught that you can't make them, let them drink Gatorade or juice because that's way too much sugar, um, and then they're going to pee out that extra sugar, and it's going to take more fluids with them and dehydrate them even more. So this study actually looked at half-diluted apple juice, and they compared the two head-to-head, -head, randomized, and what was interesting is they had fewer treatment failures with the preferred oral agent, right? So instead of torturing these poor children with Pedialyte, have the parents do half dilute apple juice. If you actually want parents to make their own electrolyte solution, the WHO has recommendations where you can add salt and sugar and it's very cheap and it's exactly uh, very easy to make. But even better, dilute some apple juice or a, a solution of preference, right? Less IV uh, conversions, less hospitalizations, right? And they actually did well. They didn't have the bounce backs. So something to consider for your next round in. So let's say you get to the point where you decide I need IV fluids, right? What's the best IV fluid to give? How many of you are plasma light converters? It's not an AA meeting. Go ahead, raise your hands. No, some of you aren't even, that, okay. So some of us have swum back and forth in the adult side, right? Plasma light is better than LR, is better than normal saline. Well, this was a study that looked at um, several hundred kids and, and compared them. Randomized trial in gastroenteritis. So it's an IV, so it's at least moderate to, to severe gastroenteritis. And they found that plasma light was well tolerated. They had a more rapid improvement in the serum bicarb and dehydration scores. Overall, clinically, probably not the biggest change or, or mind-blowing thing where I'm going to switch all my kids to plasma light. But I think there's more and more data coming out trying to figure out what is the best crystalloid solution to help give to our patients. This is another study that came out with rapid IV hydration therapy with acute gastroenteritis. Again, because it's IV, we're talking moderate to severe gastroenteritis. Oops, excuse me. They did two regimens. They did high dose fluids, 60 cc's per kilo right away, and they did 20 cc's per kilo and then switched them to oral as soon as they could. And they compared them head to head and they said there really actually wasn't a huge difference. Maybe there was a slight increase in length of stay and a slight increase in hospitalization rates with the rapid or the high volume solution. What was the point of this to me? It was, there was no need to kind of rush in the fluids, right? Even PALS, I think, has kind of gone away from, you know, 
Traditionally, sepsis was like pummel them with fluids, up to 100 cc's per kilogram in that first hour for pediatric sepsis. Now the revised guidelines are a lot more, recommend 20 cc's per kilo, reassess. 20 cc's per kilo, reassess. 20 cc's per kilo, reassess. And the point is not that they don't need fluids. In fact, I agree that most kids are under-resuscitated. The point was frequent reassessments, right? Instead of just pummeling with them fluids, starting the pump and leaving them away. So, so that was fluids, gastroenteritis. I have a couple more articles about fluids in general that don't really fall into a specific category, but well worth mentioning. One is DKA, right? We're always still in that kind of mix right now. They actually randomized about 50 patients to time to metabolic normalization, looking at pH, looking at bicarb, um, and they did a low volume versus a high volume strategy. And they found that the higher volume may have shortened metabolic normalization, but it really didn't change your length of stay or uh, overall admission rates. So again, for me, slow and steady when it comes to fluids. Frequent reassessments is, a lot, is probably the bigger key in a lot of this. The fluid trial, the well, I'm going to forget the full acronym, and, and that's, I have to admit, for someone who loves it, mnemonics as much as I do, I really forget the, the acronyms of the actual studies. But it's the uh, DKA, fluid resuscitation, what type of fluid, how fast to give it. They're almost finishing up with that study, and hopefully we'll get some very specific data soon. All right. Crystalloid fluid choice and clinical outcomes in sepsis, now that we're talking about that. Huge retrospective cohort study. They looked at 12,000 matched patients in severe sepsis or shock. Remember, SOFA, QSOFA doesn't apply to the pediatric population yet. Over 300 hospitals, and they looked at outcomes being mortality, AKI, dialysis, and length of stay, and found that lactated ringer compared to normal saline didn't really have a much better outcome. There was no significant difference. Bringing back the point home to me that it doesn't really matter which fluid choice I use at this point in time, it's frequent reassessments, slow and steady. More studies are needed in that regard. So the bottom line, again, frequent reassessments, slow and steady. Consider half-diluted apple juice for your cases of mild gastroenteritis, and zo and go uh, without necessarily needing routine use of electrocardiograms beforehand. All right, we're okay so far? Are we learning some stuff? I'm hoping so. I'm seeing some nods. All right, if I didn't get you with the other hacks, I'm hoping to get you this time. I decided to spend a little bit of time <laughs> almost as much time, apparently, um, looking up the articles as I did some extra things. So the internet is weird. I'm kicking it old school. I, I was searching the internet for things that make you go, hmm, because I really wanted to hone in the, oh, I didn't know that factor. So I'm hoping here, if I didn't get you before, I'll get you now. All right. Did you know that goats have rectangular pupils? Actually, some people are nodding. Yeah, I knew that. Remember, I just asked for one thing. I'm, I'm, saving a, I'm seeing a lot of my bar tabs going down. All right, that's okay. Did you know that penguins, when they select a mate, they, they actually give them a pebble? Right? Brings new, kind of new definition to, wow, did you see the rock he gave her? Right? All right. And since we're in Florida, do you know that there's more plastic flamingos than actual flamingos? <laughs> Go figure. All right. <sighs> Random. Disney... Uh, it would be wrong of me not to include a Disney reference here. Disney's Moana, one of the more recent, um, popular, I believe. Uh, so in Italy, the Disney movie Moana had to change its title to Oceana because a famous porn star had the exact same name. <laughs> hmm, hmm. This isn't, can you imagine all those people that showed up going, yeah, no, 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 no. All right. There's a synonym for the word synonym. All right. I'll buy a drink for whoever can pronounce this one. All right. I don't know how to pronounce it. I'm going to try. Atari and Chuck E. Cheese, what do they have in common? They were both founded by the same man. Who knew? Right. How many of you remember Atari? Uh-oh, hands went down. OK, all right. All right, and finally, this is cutting hot off the presses. Monopoly. Fan favorite? Goodbye to the boot, the wheelbarrow, and the thimble. Welcome to the rubber ducky, T-Rex, and a penguin, right? Th this is like cutting edge stuff. Don't ever say that this, this lecture didn't teach you something new. All right. All right, final, we're going to talk about some booze and how disappointed was I when it actually wasn't real booze, it was just brew, right? Apparently, it's the formerly known as apparent life-threatening event. Now the new terminology is brew, brief, resolved, unexplained event. Let's take a case. Three-month male comes in with a URI, right? He's discharged from the ED. Three days later, he has choking, gagging, turns blue around the mouth for several minutes, but 
he looks totally, totally fine in your ED. A couple years ago, that was, I think many of us would have said, ALTI, admit, for monitoring, maybe some testing, and easy, right? It was almost before some of these algorithm pathways come in. It was like that 70-year-old that with a syncopal episode. You felt like you had to do something, right? So case two, the three-month-old who's an X34-weaker, episode of a shrill cry, increased tone, shallow breathing, lasted a minute, completely resolved after three minutes, and now looked fine. How would you do anything different? Well, before, you may not have done anything different. You'll call them both ALTI and moved on. Maybe the first one, you got such a good h &P, you were convinced it was just choking or gagging, but then you still didn't know what to do because the definition of ALTI previously was an episode frightening to the observers characterized by some combination of apnea, color change, change in muscle tone, choking, gagging, and ultimately, I mean, they called it apparent life-threatening event, right? The fact that they included, the, it was frightening to the observer, that kind of bundled it into this definition that, that really many of us didn't know what to do with. The nice thing that came out, and this is the, another clinical policy and recommendation that I'd highlight and would recommend reading, came out in pediatrics this last year, um, evaluation of low-risk infants. They defined it. They said you're less than one year of age. ALTI didn't have a definition of age. It said plus you have not just color change, but specifically cyanosis and pallor. So if they turned red in the face, it didn't count. If they had absent, decreased, or irregular breathing, they kind of define that a little more, hyper or hypotonia, so change in tone, and any level of altered level of responsiveness. They got rid of that concept of frightening to the caregiver, and they renamed it because it's really hard to discharge someone home with an apparent life-threatening event. Please return for seizures or death, right? So they kind of adjust this a little bit. The low-risk definitions, if you are 60 days, you adjust for some post-conceptual age regarding prematurity. Is this your first event? All right, recurrent events, you, you fail this. Duration less than a minute, no CPR by a trained provider. We're not necessarily talking about the 10-year-old sister that blew in the face. A reassuring history exam in your ED. Those were all low-risk patients that could be safely discharged home with the following recommendations. Who's low risk? They divided it up into should, may, should not, need not. That's helpful for us. And they say you should do a shared decision-making process with a family. That's good. I like that. I think that's a great trend that we have in emergency medicine right now. You may consider brief period of observation. They didn't delineate in the ED or upstairs. You may consider pertussis, right? Young infants, uh, pertussis and RSV are, are known to cause apnea as presenting symptoms. You may consider an EKG. That was interesting. That was weak evidence, but you may consider it. Now that I mentioned weak evidence, they actually pretty much across the board, all of these recommendations were fairly weak, with the exception of should not. That was the one category in this whole recommendation that had a strong recommendation. No routine lab testing. Right? We've moved away from a lot of routine things. Bronchiolitis, no routine steroids, no routine um, nebulizers, no routine testing across the board. So for low-risk brew patients, no routine labs. And we're talking CBC, blood culture, CSF, CSF culture, even chest x-rays, right? Need not viral panel, you could consider it, right? Need not urinalysis, as opposed to our earlier talk on fevers, and need not routine admission for monitoring. So this gave us a nice delineation. First of all, it greatly gave us a definition, and hopefully we'll have improved literature and research in this specific area, but it gave us a guideline not to feel this obligation to A, routinely test everything, and B, routinely admit all these patients. So. This is my own addition in there. I'm always going to encourage you to should and may consider NAT. In seven years that I've been back at Maryland, I've never had a lecture on non-accidental trauma because we've done a symptom-based approach on vomiting, on dyspnea, on pain. And because I feel that any of those should be concerning worrisome signs for non-accidental trauma, we should always keep it on our forefront, our back front, across the hair, ears front, uh, just something to consider. Now, this policy specifically says you do not need to do routine CT testing and skeletal surveys and everything. I'm just asking you to consider it. Ultimately, at the end of the day, much like bronchiolitis, if you gave them a neb and no, the bronchiolitis police aren't going to come chasing after you. For this, even though they mentioned you should or may consider a brief observation, that's, I think, worthwhile for parents. Right? Watch them in the ED on a, for a period of time. If you're very uncomfortable, if the parents are uncomfortable, be part of that shared decision making, Admit them upstairs for overnight monitoring. It's something to consider. Don't feel that you can't do anything, that you aren't allowed to do anything. You always have the observation, uh, option of observation. All right. 
So bottom line for all the concepts today. Fever, check the P. Fluids, go slow and steady, frequent reassessments. And finally, brew, it's all about the H and P. We have a strict definition now, and remember to consider a brief observation. No need for routine testing across the board. All right. Uh, this is my email address. I'm happy to send any, uh, if you need my slides or specific copies of any of these articles, I'm happy to, to send them to you. In the meantime, I'm happy to field any questions, and I hope that every single one of you has learned at least one thing new. Again, maybe not clinical, maybe not even practical, but gosh darn it, you learned something. Thank you so much for your time, and I'm...